Let's begin. <laughs> hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Ever need to go back for seconds? Can't seem to get your fill of the good stuff? Well, get comfortable for a true fourth meal as I serve you up tonight's dastardly dish, one I like to call succulent flesh. Cypher looked down at the mess resting at his feet. The meat of the abdomen flayed wide open. Sternum cracked, phasia weeping from between skin and muscle, mixing with intracellular fluids in an almost oatmeal-like consistency. The man's face was locked in a twisted expression that was contorted by terror and further augmented by severe mutilation. His eyes were missing, nose snapped to the side and barely still attached, and the numerous dark holes told a story of twenty-seven repeated stabs to the face. Now that his hands and feet had been removed, he barely even looked human anymore. Cypher wiped his brow, smearing a patch of slick red blood across his face as he did. He marveled at his work, thinking about all the effort the local police would have to put in to clean this mess up. He would of course leave it to them after all. A scene like this fit his calling card perfectly as the Bloomsburg Butcher. Still, he had to make haste at the very least of cleaning himself and absconding from the premises. It was late at night, and there hadn't been a soul to be seen for hours. But it would be daybreak soon, and the bustle of campus life was sure to begin. Setting down the knife and using the sink's basin nearby, he was relatively sure that he was clean enough. He was lucky to have such a place to wash himself so close by, but there were no mirrors in the industrial kitchen, and besides a cursory glance into one of the reflective surfaces, warped and blurry, he had no way to actually make sure. There was so much blood on everything every surface, and spread wide across the smooth linoleum floor. Cypher had to step carefully around it so as to not leave any footprints behind. He may have been sloppy, but he was surely not keen on getting caught, and had at least covered up his actions enough so that they surely would never pinpoint him, or so he thought. Opening the doors of the dark campus cafeteria, Cypher slinked out into what remained of the night, shielded from cameras due to his disposable garb, unseen by witnesses, and disappeared into the waning darkness beyond, leaving the macabre scene behind him. By the time Cypher opened his eyes the following morning, the sun had long since arisen over the horizon. Like any other person, on any other day, Cypher climbed from beneath the covers on his bed, went about making himself ready for the day, ending with a cup of coffee and the local morning news. He couldn't help but smile to himself when the newscaster relayed information of the body they discovered early that morning. Cypher grinned as the man on the television explained how the kitchen staff had found him, how some were likely to seek counseling, and how this seemed to be the work of the now nearly infamous Bloomsburg Butcher. Sure, he couldn't enjoy the fame that came with it, but there was a widespread recognition for his work nonetheless, and besides, yesterday was his birthday, and this was a present to himself. Personally satisfied, downing the last gulp of liquid inside his cup that had become lukewarm by then, Cypher stood to walk the cup to the kitchen to be placed 
on the sink so that he could start his day. However, before he could exit the room, and within audible distance from the television speakers, the newscaster spoke once more, causing Cypher to stop dead in his tracks. As the man on TV divulged more and more, Cypher had begun to slowly turn and face the screen once again. The man explained how another body of a local was found in the evening the night before, mutilated and filleted, teeth marks found on whatever flesh remained on the victim, and the scene was notably cleaner, more thought out and ambiguous. The man explained how now the police were unsure if the butcher was indeed one person or if the crimes were even related. This all meant one thing to Cypher, however. Someone was stealing his recognition. He'd become so infuriated and mentally discorporated, nerves and rage all surfacing immensely at once, he failed to notice the mug had even slipped from his fingers, impacting against the hardwood floor with a smash. It took him some time to finally shake his feelings of looming dread enough to go about his day. Today was his day off, but he had no interest in wasting it behind locked doors. If anything, he could use this time to select his next victim, to be victimized at a later point in time after some of the heat had died down. Still, Cypher couldn't seem to free himself from the thought of another killer in town. Sure, he wasn't the only one in the world, but the chances of two serial murderers operating in the same small town at the same time was highly unlikely. Cypher rounded the corner of his apartment building and towards his vehicle, unnoticing of the woman that was approaching from behind him. Cypher was so lost in thought, in fact, that when the detective said, Excuse me, can I speak with you for a moment? Cypher nearly jumped out of his skin. Spinning quickly and nearly a jump in his step, Cypher turned to see a tall, well-dressed woman standing behind him and looking at him with a clearly fake demeanor of befriending. Excuse me? Who are you? Cypher asked, but he could already tell, judging the woman on her black slacks and expensive underdress that surely concealed a firearm. And he was right. My name is Detective Foley, and I was just hoping to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. She stated plainly. Cypher knew it didn't matter if he minded or not. The smart thing to do would be to humor the woman to avoid suspicion. Well, it's my day off, so yeah, I've got a spare minute. How can I help you? He said, trying to sound as genuine as he could, though he wasn't sure if it had worked. Well, honestly, I'd like for you to accompany me to the station, since it's your day off and all. The detective elaborated. Cypher thought for a moment before responding with, Well, I said I had a spare minute, not a spare hour. Unfortunately, I do have some plans today. Well, I suppose I can just ask you now. I'm sure you've heard of the murders. The detective paused, awaiting affirmation from Cypher, and once again getting a nod. She continued. Well, one of the team found something curious in the college cafeteria last night, where that kid was mutilated. It's nothing major, but I would like to talk to you about it. So, you said you can stop by tomorrow? She finished. Cypher began to sweat. He tried to hide it, but he could feel the beads of moisture forming on his brow. Sure, sure, sure thing. Um, ten o'clock okay? Cypher asked. The detective said nothing for a moment, facilitating a long, awkward silence before responding with, Sure, I'll let my team know you're coming, and I'll be sure to be there. Cypher nodded in agreement, already working on some kind of contingency as he took the woman's business card and turned to walk away. Oh, and don't go leaving town or anything. It can make you seem really suspicious, and we wouldn't want that. The detective said, causing Cypher to turn and face her, nodding his head once more. 
Both individuals then turned and headed in opposite directions. Cypher's head was full of what's and why's, but the thought that ran continuously through his mind was, how would he get out of this? For leaving now was no longer an option. As Cypher walked a long park trail only a short drive away, thoughts of the day's events pulsed fervently in his head. What did the detective want? Had he been found out? And if so, how? And who else was killing people in town, adding to his body count? Would he be pinned for those murders too? Was there an elaborate scheme underfoot designed to place him in the spotlight for everything? If these instances were not connected, would it throw the cops off his trail? If they were even on it? Cypher sighed, thinking to himself how this was the worst part, and almost the most exhilarating part of being a monster, a killer of men, women, and children alike. He wasn't sure how yet, but he knew he'd get away with it. He always had. A small smile graced his expression as he thought about his deeds, his freedom, full of pride for himself, his superiority over the people that surrounded him. It was then that a text notification recentered him back to the here and now. The message was ominous, and if that wasn't enough, he also had no recognition of the number, or who it was from, only that whoever had sent it intended for him to go on some kind of ominous scavenger hunt, insinuating three words. Behind the Firehouse. Texting back, asking who the hell this was, only a receipt of failure to send was sent back, even after multiple attempts. Still at a loss, his decision was made. He would go prepared, but he would certainly heed the message. He didn't know who it was that was messing with him, messing with his life, but he was determined to soon find out. By the time he had arrived at his destination, the sun was starting to dip low in the sky. Apparently, the address under the text he had received indicated a now-vacant building on the outskirts of the suburbs. There was no one at the firehouse when he arrived, but still, he made sure to park in a discreet location before making his way into the woods out back, trying not to call attention to himself or what he might be doing there. Methodically and undetected, Cypher crept into the tree line and disappeared from sight of any would-be passing motorists. He had no idea what he was doing here, or what he was looking for, but soon an odd aroma faintly filled his nostrils. It was sour and almost metallic, and he knew immediately what it was. Turning towards the trajectory he intended to follow, Cypher walked faster and it wasn't long before he came to discover what he was there to find. At first, he didn't know what this was, because they barely even resembled a human being anymore. What was left of their face was so covered in red, the bulbous end of the corpse resembled that of an exploded cherry, red liquid, semi-clotted from sitting in the open air for so long, but still partially fluid as well. The layers of liquid tissue, too, thick to have completely dried. Cypher thought he could see bits of teeth within the slowly putrefying mess, but the mouth looked as if it had been forced far to one side, making it impossible to tell if they were simply fragments of bone or not. The clothes that remained had been ripped instead of removed, and the abdomen so severely mangled it was hard to discern if any organs at all remained within the body. Any exposed flesh present seemed ravaged, like wads of used chewing gum discarded, pre-masticated mouthfuls of fatty gristle, and it was this thought 
that made him realize that someone or something had been feeding on this corpse like an animal. Cypher bent down to inspect the form a little closer, and when he did, the small white corner of a piece of paper jutting from inside the pocket of the victim's shirt caught his attention. Careful not to touch the body at all, Cypher pulled the object free and instantly recognized it as a business card. His face drained of all color, his eyes widened like a frightened cat, and he nearly fell backwards onto his backside. It was the detective's card, and after inspecting the corpse a little closer for hair color and any other minute features that remained, Cypher realized that this was likely Detective Foley. But how? Why? The sight of blood and gore truly never bothered him, but the implications of what now lay at his feet caused him to begin visibly shaking. The police were somehow on to him. There was another killer in town, and now this. That's when he started pulling the information in his mind into a single, cohesive thought, fully believing that he now finally understood the truth of it all. Whoever this mysterious person was, they were setting him up for a fall. They had to be. Cypher left the woods much in a way that he entered, quickly and quietly, unnoticed. Pulling from where he had parked, back onto the road, heading as far away from there as he could, only one thought kept repeating over and over in his mind with absolute conviction. Whoever is doing this needs to be stopped. As Cypher drove, he thought about texting this mysterious individual again, but stopped upon giving it some thought. In reality, he likely shouldn't have tried responding via his personal phone in the first place. Secondly, after he had discovered what he had, at the behest of a strange message, only one other thing was certain. This person would be contacting him again, not the other way around right on cue, as if the universe was listening in on his own private thoughts. His phone alerted him of another text message. Being careful to keep his eyes on the road, he reached beside him in the seat, picked up his phone, and unlocked it to read the message. Flashing his eyes between the road and the small screen, it took a moment for him to read it in its entirety. Come to 1736 Locust Lane. 17815, 9 p.m. tonight. We need to talk. Come alone. And don't do anything stupid. I know who you are. Cypher frowned at the thought. How could he have been so stupid? How could he have messed up so bad that his identity had been revealed? He couldn't be sure if he would be outnumbered what blackmail stipulations may be placed, or any other number of variables. He could run, change his name, and move to a new place where no one knew him. He had done it before. But the pull of curiosity and an inner need for revenge on whoever was pulling these strings compelled him to go to the address as instructed. The hope of wreaking havoc on whoever this was seemed to outweigh the danger of whatever their plans were and his inability to escape from them. So, his mind had been made up, and this meddler would truly get to know who he really was. When he first pulled up, he thought that maybe he had the wrong address. On the lot sat a small house, two stories tall and clearly condemnable, as the properties around it sat vacant and served as large yards for the time being, having already been demolished some time ago. Each and every window had been boarded up with plywood, so if someone was squatting inside, Cypher was unable to see any indication of light or light. He was sure, though, 
that this was the address, having triple-checked it, and thus left the confines of his vehicle and approached the building. Not another soul in sight. The steps groaned beneath his feet, threatening to give way, and he then realized how foolish he had been. If there was someone inside, he had just announced his arrival. Still, attempting to make less of an entrance and conceal himself the best he was able to going forward, Cypher placed his feet at the edge of the steps as he made his ascent, mitigating any further subsequent sounds. The door was boarded up much the same way the windows were, but when he tried the knob, it turned with ease, unlatching the door and allowing him to push it open. This time he did try to avoid it, but the door creaked open anyway, ignoring his attempts at silence. Cypher was astonished to see light emanating from a large room to his left, cutting through the darkness as being the only light for a mile, immediately grabbing his focus. Taking a breath, resolved to his intentions, Cypher stepped inside and slowly closed the door. Every instinct within screamed at him to call out, Hello? to announce himself, but his attention to the situation demanded that he do otherwise. Instead, he crept forward the few steps to his left and peered into the living room beyond, now seen to be aglow with the brilliance of various candles, possibly a hundred or more. The floor and walls were old and warped, dust covered every surface, and cobwebs hung thick in every corner. In the center of the room looked to be a large dining room table, newer looking than the rest of the room that it sat within, but upon it looked to be the remains of at least two dead bodies, though it was hard for Cypher to tell. The corpses were severely mutilated and disorganized, laying haphazard in a somewhat pile at the right side of its surface. Beside it sat a barely conscious bound victim, bleeding profusely from his scalp, his mouth gagged by duct tape. Cypher couldn't understand how he was not able to smell this from the street, or even once he had stepped inside. But now that he was so close to it, the intense smell of copper and bile filtered in through his nostrils. There was blood everywhere, mostly pooled underneath that table. But as he stared on, Cypher saw something else, an object that sat weirdly out of place on the other end of the table. He was still a few feet away when he recognized it, but had to pick it up to inspect it to be sure. He was. This was his knife. How did his knife end up here? He began thinking back, plucking through his memories to uncover any hint at the logistics of such an event, and just before he could place his finger on it, he heard the front door slam closed. Someone else had just entered the house. Cypher turned with a startle, facing the direction of the door, before slowly moving towards the living room archway. No other sounds could be heard, and he was stealthy in his approach, but as he neared the corner of the aperture, Surprise! A young woman jumped out from around the side of it, into his direct line of sight, only a few feet away, causing Cypher to jump and yell with a sudden shock. As he eyed her, though, his defenses dropped. This girl was short, not much younger than him, wearing a thick puff coat, had hair of bright red, half covered by a beanie, and her gleaming green eyes stared right back into his. But it was not her small stature or unimposing presence that stopped him from attacking her. It was because he recognized her. S sis Cypher stuttered out in disbelief. The one and only. Man, <laughs> I got you good, huh? The girl chuckled, responding back. But, but how? Why? Cypher spat out 
wanting to ask a plethora of questions that he could not seem to formulate the words for. Well, it was your birthday the other day. I was in town, thought I'd stop by, and you'll never guess what I saw, she said, and Cypher remained silent, letting her finish. I saw you leaving that cafeteria on campus, and I saw the cops roll in a few hours later. You idiot! You forgot that thing at the scene, she replied, pointing at the knife that was in his hand. So, it was you? You did all of this? Cypher questioned her further. Well, yeah. Duh. The detective was easy. The rest of her team, though, that took some doing. But all that's left of them is over there. She pointed at the table behind Cypher. Well, yeah, you gave me quite the scare, Andrina. Congratulations. Aren't you supposed to be taking care of some kid you inherited through your own adventures? Cypher said, quoting this last part with his fingers. Well, you know me. I was always a fan of veal. Andrina smiled. And after that incident at Penn State and my run-ins with the police, a short while after, the little shit provided the best kind of cover. She finished. So then, why are you here? Cypher asked. Well, mostly because I was hungry. See, that's the problem with you, Cypher. I eat my kills. You leave evidence all over the place. You remember the last time? Andrina questioned, and Cypher looked down at his feet, nodding his head in agreement. Exactly. Mom and Dad have a lot of political power at their fingertips, but they can't keep cleaning up your mess. And when I found out you were in the area as well, I knew you'd probably need my help. And that you did. Andrina said. So what now? Cypher questioned. Andrina approached the squirming victim in the corner, pulling Cypher's weapon from his hand. Now? Now we pack a lunch. It's going to be a while before we get a chance to grab another bite. She smiled, applying pressure of the blade to the victim's flesh, slowly slicing his throat from ear to ear, enjoying watching him struggle as the life drained out of him. Sorry, I usually prefer women. But you'll just have to do. She whispered in his ear as the man fell lifeless. The police would have another mess to clean up and another mystery to solve, but Andrina solidified their escape. Cypher remained laying low for a long time to come. However, Andrina would not. Herb staining from fresh meat wouldn't last long, and soon, she would be looking for her next victim once again, in any city or any town, maybe even yours. Now, that's what I like to call having your cake and eating him too. Though when your family is in town, food is a must. But if you're still hungry for more gore galore, stop by next weekend for your just desserts. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>